Get 12 issues of the magazine plus a £20 Amazon voucher for just £12. If it sounds too good to be true, that's because it is. Go to spectator.co.uk forward slash TV offer to take it up. Now, first, COVID case rates in Bolton are more than 10 times the English average. In Bedford, more than six. The Indian variant of COVID has been rising in these areas, leading to fears that the UK could go the way of India, which saw a surge of cases resulting in the dwindling of medical supplies and hospitals being overrun. It's this new strain which is thought to have contributed to the virus getting out of control, with outstanding questions about its transmissibility. Although, of course, problems with India's vaccine rollout have played a major role as well. So the question today is, could that happen here? And are we going to see the UK's long-awaited Freedom Day put on hold? To discuss, I'm joined now by UCL's Professor Christina Pagel. Christina, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. We've gotten a sense over the past 24 to 48 hours that the Prime Minister and his officials think concerns over the Indian variant may have been a false alarm, but you disagree. I don't think we know yet whether it was a, a false alarm or not. Um, certainly, cases are still going up quite significantly. Um, the latest data from the UK COVID um, Genetics Consortium, which sequences data here, shows that it's about 35% of all cases now sequenced is this new variant. Um, the Welcome Sanger data, which was released on Monday, which updates weekly and just takes community cases, so removes cases from travel and surge testing, are up to 28% of cases. So there's no doubt that it's been going up. Now, the question is, is growth slowing? Are the measures that they've put in place working? Um, and as we get more cases, do we get a better handle on how much more transmissible it is? And, and it is very sensitive to it. So I think there is agreement that it's more transmissible than the dominant, what's called the Kent variant in the UK. But um, it's kind of, if it's only 10% more, then there probably won't be a big issue this summer. But if it's 50% more, there could be a really big issue. So until we pin that down, I think it's, it's too early to say whether it's a false alarm. So I've seen figures that say that the Indian variant is roughly 20% of the cases across England. There you cited 35. If it were significantly transmissible or if we were in danger of seeing exponential growth, why wouldn't this be reflected in the national data when actually it remains the case that we're around 97% below the peak of cases and deaths 99% below the peak? Yeah, so that 20% that figure comes from the um, COG, the COVID Genetics Consortium website, but that's over the last two weeks. And so two weeks ago, it was 15% and then it went up to 30%. So that's kind of the average of both of them. So over the last week, it has gone up further. Um, the reason cases have still been going down is because the dominant variant, so the Kent variant, that has been declining. And so effectively, you've had two epidemics. You've had one where cases are going down, and one, which starting from much smaller numbers, is going up. And that's masking the rise of the Indian variant. We saw exactly the same thing in Europe in January and February, when our variant was becoming dominant there, and the old variant was dying out, that actually cases were coming down, even while the Kent variant was increasing. So the question is, can we, can we delay the increase of this variant long enough and vaccinate enough people so that we can, we can actually continue opening or not? And we just, and I don't think we know that yet. So we're not yet at the situation where this variant is dominant in England. And until it is, you wouldn't expect it to start driving overall numbers. But we have the vast, vast majority of the most vulnerable in the UK vaccinated. We now have 34, 35 year olds getting vaccinated. Well over 20 million people have their second jab. Uh, so in terms of those who would have been vulnerable last year when the circumstances were different, we're in very different territory now. And cases are still at rock bottom, hospitalizations, deaths as well. What's the reason for not pushing ahead with opening up? Well, it's certainly Truth. I mean, like the vaccines are great. And if we didn't have the vaccine program, we would be in a situation that India is facing right now or Nepal is facing right now, where they're seeing, you know, terrible surges and hospitals overfilling and, and people dying on the streets. Now, we're not in that situation. And that is because of our vaccine program. But if you have a variable, and this is what the SAGE modeling subgroup shows, this is, you know, this, the government's own scientific advisors show that if you have a variant that is 50% that is more transmissible, even if the vaccines work just as well as they do now, even if you have really high uptake, which we do, that's all in the model, you can still get to a situation where you overwhelm hospitals. And that's just because if you have an incredibly large number of people infected, 
even a tiny percentage that then gets sick and the vaccines aren't perfect, so even three, three, four percent is still enough to create, to create stress on the NHS. Now, if it's just 20 or 30 percent more transmissible, you're not going to see that level. So that's kind of why it's really, really important that we pin down exactly how much more transmissible it is. And we're told that we're going to have that data in the coming weeks. But one of the issues that we have had over the course of the pandemic is that a lot of the modeling that's taken place within SAGE, within government, has been based on worst case scenarios. And the lab data and real world data that we continue to get shows that the vaccines are far more effective than often the modeling takes into account. I know that you've been quite cautious and nervous about the reopening that's taken place so far, and certainly around the 21st of June. But if all the data continues to point in the right direction, would there be any reason not to go ahead with it? So firstly, the latest SAGE modellings are not based on worst case scenarios. They use up-to-date data from Public Health England and the latest published information in the New England Journal and the science, you know, in science on vaccine efficacy. They assume very, very high vaccine efficacy that comes directly from our data. They assume very high vaccine uptake, which comes directly from our data. And it's because that data is better than was expected in February and March that their models are actually showing um, a much more limited surge. So under the old, under the Kent variant, if we didn't have this new variant, their models are showing actually we probably would be fine to open this summer because they're using actual real data. They're not modeling a worst case scenario right now. Now, the new variant does change things. Um, if it comes to, you know, three weeks time and cases are still going down overall, then yes, I think we're in a situation where you can say, okay, the new variant turned out not to be as bad as we feared we're in a position where we can open further. But we don't know that yet because we're not there yet. So that's that's all I'm saying. I'm saying, you know, we, we can't promise where we're going to be in a few, a few weeks because that data is not here yet. Well, I don't think anyone can promise anything um, over the course of this pandemic. We know that the virus continues to surprise us. But as we're not expected to do the next phase of reopening until the 21st of June, where do you really differ from the government's projected timelines and policies for reopening? Um, well, I, did I say I differed? <laughs> I, I, what I differ in is saying that, that we can, we can put a date on it. And that I don't think we should say that the 21st of June is a special date. And that if we miss it, it's a big disaster. But I think where, where I differ most on are, are two things. One is international travel and our border policy. So, you know, we saw that in January and February, we were very focused on, um, on the Brazilian and the South African variants, you know, the, the, well, rather the variants that were discovered there. And we kind of had a red list and, and thought that would keep them out. And we certainly have controlled those variants in the UK. They're at very, very low levels. And we just, and then it turned out that the next dangerous variant came from India. We don't know where the next dangerous variant is coming from. COVID is still um, running rampant in many countries across the world. And many of them don't sequence right? And so it's not until too late that we understand that there's a new variant that's arisen. So I think this summer, while we're still find, trying to finish vaccinating our population, is not the right summer to have international travel and risk new importations. Um, the other thing... You say, it's a, you say it's a dangerous variant, but the evidence hasn't quite held that up yet. I mean, all of the lab and real world, da da real world data that we're getting about the variant would suggest that vaccines holds up against it. And COVID has mutated many of thousands of times. So at what point do you think it would be safe to open up the borders more and to resume some kind of normal international so, travel? When I said, is it about vaccination when, numbers? Is it about COVID levels? When I said that it is dangerous, it is dangerous because it is more transmissible. And that, and that makes it harder to keep COVID under control. There's no, there's no doubt that even if it's just 10% more transmissible, we, we would be in a better position if it wasn't here. I mean, well, that, in, indeed, we'd be and, in a much and, better and position we actually, if we didn't we don't have... have the final evidence. Like the, the, the deputy chair of JCVI, the government's vaccination subcommittee, he said that actually it does resist the vaccines more than the Kent variant. Now, it seems to protect against severe illness, but you can get sick and you can pass it on if you're vaccinated. Now, what that means is that it's even it makes it more transmissible, right? Because it means that you can pass it on even if you don't personally get sick. We don't know what impact that will have on long COVID. We don't know if it will mutate further, given, given the, the, the opportunities here. So, so I think saying that any new variant that is fitter than the last variant is a dangerous occurrence 
it's true. Most mutations don't become fitter. They die out. This one is not dying out. It's dominating in India. It's dominating in Nepal. In every country it's been discovered, it's growing rapidly. So it's kind of, it's the next Kent variant, if you like. Now, if we're lucky, it won't be fit enough to overcome our vaccination program. COVID is a dangerous virus, variants included, but we now see that cases are decelerating or even declining in the major outbreaks in the UK. Cases also appear to be leveling off in India. To go back to that original question, given the fact that we may be living with variants for years to come and indeed indefinitely, at what point would you say you think we can start to resume some normality when it comes to international travel and perhaps some of those bigger decisions around large-scale events and the complete removal of social distancing, if this is something we're likely to have to live with for a long so, time? I would like us to follow Israel's example, where they only opened up once they'd fully vaccinated. And we're only about 35% fully vaccinated of adults. Fully vaccinated, um, about 75, 80% of all adults in Israel, and they're now vaccinating adolescents. Um, and they're the only country that's actually achieved control of COVID to, to almost zero levels through vaccination. Other countries with high vaccination rates are still seeing a lot of outbreak because they haven't got to that level yet. And Israel closed its borders entirely while it was doing its vaccination program. And even now has quite strict border controls and even now still asks people to wear masks inside and has masks inside schools. But they are reaping the benefits because they've, they've managed to open their economy almost entirely without seeing any kind of resurgence of COVID. So that's what I would like to see. I'd like to see us get to the stage where we have vaccinated maybe 80, 85% of all adults fully and have a plan for how we potentially boost against variants and vaccinate adolescents. Um, and that should be by September. It's not that far away, right? And I think, so for me, 2022, let's open, right? That's fine. You know, we'll know a lot more about variants. We'll have new vaccines. Most of our population will be protected. We hopefully will be at least near the um, threshold where you can rely on population immunity to keep new outbreaks low and contained. So that that's how I see it. When you say let's open, obviously the opening process is phased. Would you, in your ideal scenario, be rolling back some of the reopening we've done? Would you pause it here? Or would you just continue to follow the data in whichever direction it took us? I think I'd follow the data. I mean, at the moment, um, if it was up to me, I would have delayed Monday's reopening by a few weeks um, until, until we actually did know more about this variant. Now I think it's too late to roll it back. Um, but I'll be, I'll be watching the data really carefully. And if it turns out it's fine, then then okay, then we keep going. You know, I'm not I'm not saying that that in in falling cases we should have more restrictions, but I, I do think that the data is there to be concerned right now. And there are perfectly reasonable explanations for why we're not seeing um, an overall increase, because we don't have this variant being dominant yet. And we we're in a situation where one variant's falling and the other variant's going up and they and they haven't overtaken each other yet. Back in early April, you also warned about the 12th of April reopening, telling The Independent that we are seeing the same things we saw last year and in the autumn, none of the fundamentals have changed. But of course, we saw schools reopen, shops, outdoor hospitality, more households mixing outdoors. Of course, it's too early to say what the 17th of May reopening is going to do, but we just have not seen that national surge in infection, hospitalizations, or death. The opposite, in fact. So would you agree that now that the fundamentals have changed and that they are looking more positive? I never said that we were going to have a surge in infections and hospitalizations from from that reopening. And in fact, the SAGE models from February and March said that the dangerous step was the step we've just taken in May, not the one in April. What I said well, was that there had been the an fundamentals increase. Hadn't I, I said changed. that there had been an increase in cases in March in schools. We didn't. We haven't seen that to date since April. And I suspect that's because community transmission actually did drop a lot over Easter, which is really good news. And we were quite lucky in that we had quite nice Easter weather, so people could go outside. But we are now seeing where cases are going up. So in Bolton, cases in school-aged children are higher than they've ever been in the pandemic. There are you know, over 500 cases per 100,000 per week. So it's not the case that everything's always fine. When I, we're talking about the fundamentals, what hasn't changed is that even now, people are being asked to do rapid tests, that people are being asked to test themselves all the time, but there's no real support for you if you test positive. 
there's very little financial support and so little financial incentive for people to get tested if they can't afford to then isolate at home. And it's also very disruptive to your to your life, to caring responsibilities, to school. And so we are seeing that in disadvantaged communities, they are less likely to come forward for testing and less likely to isolate and have higher rates of COVID through exposure, through work and poorer housing. So we are seeing that there is this disparity between more well-off areas and less well-off areas. And so what worries me then and worries me now is that actually what we'll see is that COVID becomes a disease that's very associated with poverty and disadvantage. And I think that could be avoided by providing more support to those communities. I suppose the difficult thing is that lockdowns, um, regardless of, of, of what you think of them, um, level down um, in, in, in the most serious sense. And we know that they affect the poor and the disadvantaged the most. And it just comes down to that very difficult trade-off, doesn't it, about protecting people from the virus. You mentioned children there, but also, of course, the 20,000 children that we know have dropped out of school since lockdowns hit. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like no one, no one thinks lockdown is a good idea. And through good public health measures, you should be able to avoid lockdowns. Now, when you get a situation where the virus is increasing exponentially that we had um, in December, for instance, and that you know India's just had and other countries just had, and you have a situation where your hospitals are overwhelmed and an independent report that came out yesterday said that actually, yes, the NHS was overwhelmed in January, it means that no one can ac- access care in the way that you would want them to access. Now, that disrupts your economy. It disrupts people's lives. If you feel like I'm not in a position to be able to get care if I get sick, it's going to restrict your behaviours. And so you do then end up having to have these lockdowns. And the more it gets out of control, the longer you have to lock down for to get cases back down again. Whereas if you prevent cases going up in the first place, it's much more effective. And that's been you know, my advice the whole time is if you actually did, for instance, support people to isolate, then effectively all you're doing is locking down people most likely to have COVID for a short period of time and letting the rest of the economy carry on. But we've never really done that. So we've ended up kind of opening and then the cycle of restrictions and no restrictions, restrictions and no restrictions. I don't think that's optimal health policy and I never have. But I do think that when you have a virus that goes out of control and overwhelms your hospitals and your healthcare, and actually affects the disadvantaged communities much more who had rates of COVID, you know, twice, three times the most advantaged areas and suffered much more death and disability from it, that that's a problem and you have to deal with it. Christina, thank you for joining Spectator TV.